Yes, here we are. So you may have noticed that I changed the title again. I'm very sorry for this, but uh, you may as well take this as a symptom of the instability uh, during this period of degeneration. Originally, I had planned uh, to examine the well-known traditional Tibetan pra practice of Mönlam, Pranidhana, and how its use has been adapted by the contemporary Tibetan Buddhist tradition concerning climate change. However, during the process of writing, I came into touch with the activities of a Buddhist environmental group that had been formed recently. I was given the chance to interview some of the group's organizers and participate in one of the events end of September. This led to new insights, which I wanted to integrate in the paper as well as to some changes of the original conception. Um, and how do I turn the slide now? Don't work somehow. I just have to do it here. No. Ah. Yeah. But first, some general remarks. When using the term apocalypse or eschatology in this paper, I'm well aware of the cultural connotations this term brings along. I will not use it in the Christian sense of the word, but understand it in a more uh, secular fashion. But the definition proposed by the colleagues of Sensum for apocalypticism is quite helpful in my understanding. I will not go through this to uh, constraints of time. Um, before starting, I think it's also good to highlight some particularities of Buddhist apocalypticism. The most obvious one derives from the Buddhist temporal understanding, which is based on a circular conception of time. Hence, the end is not the end, but one of many ends. And accordingly, um, prophecies uh, on the end of the Buddhist doctrine, such as the Kaushambi prophecy, relate to a specific end time. In that case, the end of the doctrine of Buddha Shakyamuni, but not of uh, uh, other Buddhas that follow. However, they only show a possible future. Due to the law of dependent origination, it is clear what the that the future can be altered. Things that come about due to an assembly of causes and conditions will eventually come to an end. It is, however, not certain when. On the contrary, for as long as the causes and conditions that brought something into being are still uh, present, that thing may continue to exist. This implies a degree of contingency, not only regarding Buddhist end time prophecy, but also concerning climate change forecasts. Um, thus, Buddhist apocalypticism can be classified as avertive apocalypticism, as defined by Daniel Wojcik, who states that avertive apocalyptic beliefs express the notion that the world is not irredeemably evil or absolutely doomed, and human agency is emphasized as the action of human beings not only may save the world from destruction, but in some cases may bring about a perfect age. Uh, a specific practice used in Buddhism to counter climate change in Tibetan Buddhism specifically is a form of prayer called Mönlam. At first glance, the idea to counter climate change with prayers may sound problematic. In common language, uh, prayers do not necessarily imply corresponding actions and are often associated with the idea that one transfers responsibility to a higher power instead. If someone would tell a climate scientist or a secular uh, climate activist that he or she would attempt to counter climate change with prayers, they would probably consider this a futile approach. So yeah, also actually a discussion that takes place at Extinction Rebellion. Um, Mönlam or Pranidhana or Resolute Aspirations is a particular practice often translated as wishing prayer. It is based on vow-like aspirations said to be performed conjointly with accumulations of merit throughout many consecutive lifetimes. Given their vow-like nature, long-term perspective, and the underlying resolve that goes along with them, they have also been dubbed paths of aspirations. It should be noted, however, that they do not constitute an independent soteriological system of Buddhist practice, but form an important part of Mahayana soteriology. While resolute aspirations occur as daily recitations in personal meditation rituals or monastic liturgies, uh, the practice is also widely known because of large prayer festivals, which are still held today, particularly at holy places like Bodh Gaya. And there's a long history of resolute aspiration prayer texts in the Indian Buddhist tradition that have been translated into Tibetan. But here, but there are also countless Tibetan Mönlam texts that constantly and constantly new ones arise or evolve. So during contemporary Monlam or resolute aspiration gatherings, the practice is often framed in the context of climate change. Uh, and a recent anthology entitled The Buddhist Response to the Climate Emergency contains writing by many well-known uh, Buddhist teachers. It is telling that the majority of Tibetan contributions take the form of resolute aspirations. Most of these works directly link climate change to narratives of the degenerated times, like, for example, the introduction to the mandala of the four 
energies in the Kali Yuga by Gyabchi Dujum Rinpoche, who, uh, for example, says, many highly realized masters of the past prophecy that events could occur in the Kali Yuga, our present era, such as the melting of great mountains, snow caps and glaciers, and other disasters involving the four elements. People's activities in general have changed in ways that have brought about global warming. Mönlam is um, a traditional Mahayana Buddhist approach that can be used, for example, as an apotropaic practice and is not only applied to climate change. It is a self-suggestive te technique to direct one's merit to a certain aim, thereby creating causes and conditions to positively influence it. It can produce hope by relying on juxtaposing dystopian and utopian perspectives and dedicating the merit and with the understanding that this would work and is embedded in the larger Buddhist enterprise of approaching Buddhahood. This is, after all, the main objective of the technique. Um, so let us turn now to the example of Extinction Rebellion Buddhist Germany. Climate scientists have been warning for decades that human-made climate change poses a threat to the world ecosystem. 30 years ago, uh, I have already myself protested against climate change and not much has happened since. Uh, it is thus unsurprising that several environmental groups have developed around the globe during the past decades. A relatively new grassroots movement, uh, Extinction Rebellion, started in the UK in response to the 2018 IPPC, IPCC a special report, um, uh, which they interpret as uh, saying that we only have 12 years to stop catastrophic climate change, asserting that we have entered the sixth mass extinction event. This eminence, eminence is visible in the symbol used by XR, which you see here uh, above the, the, the image, uh, which is a, a water class uh, inside a globe showing that uh, the time is ticking for us, the time arising to react is, um, the response is getting uh, shorter every moment. Um, XR is mostly organized for local groups based on shared location, but there are also community groups which connect members based on a shared self-identity, such as ethnicity, gender, sexuality, profession or faith. One of the latter groups is XR Buddhists. They have been active since 2019 in the UK and also in Germany. In July of this year, the German Buddhist Union, uh, Deutsche Buddhistische uh, Union, uh, a national umbrella organization of more than 60 German Buddhist organizations, shared an announcement of XR Buddhist Germany via their social media canals that informed about the group's actions in Berlin from September 17, 20, uh, to 20, 2022. And this steered a debate, uh, quite a heated debate, which caught my attention, and I contacted the group to learn more about their activities. I then interviewed uh, two of the organizers and went to Berlin as a participating observer. XR climate activists set up a tent camp in a park that you see on the, on the image, next actually um, to the Federal Ministry of Economy, Economy and Climate Protection. Um, the headquarter uh, of XR Buddhist Germany was the meditation tent, tent that you see here in the, in the middle, where they organized public talks on Buddhism, guided meditations and organizational group meetings for the other activities, but also offered a space for individual meditation. Here you can uh, see the inside of the tent temple shortly before the Buddhist climate action puja that took place on Saturday evening. Uh, on Sunday afternoon, the group organized an interfaith walking meditation for Berlin with XR uh, Faith Bridge. A distance of 600 meter was covered in one hour. Participants were dressed in colored clothes that ranged from light blue, cooler, to red warmer, representing warmer, to resemble the climate warming stripes used to visualize the data of uh, long-term climate change trends. If you look at the picture right on the, 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 the fourth person from the right uh, bottom, that, that's me. Um, well, on Monday, a further walking meditation of 200 meters was organized by Ixa Buddhists that headed to a Deutsche Bank uh, branch office. So that took like one hour. Participants were dressed in black and uh, and had signs hanging around the necks that read Deutsche Bank, stop financing coal, oil and gas to protest the bank's practice of uh, corporate finance. I'm the, I'm the guy in the back, standing at the very uh, right, uh, with a hat, uh, with a cap. Um, after the word, the group uh, continued with silent, sitting with silent sitting meditation on the street in front of the branch office. If you look carefully, uh, you, will, you will see this, the, the signs uh, hanging around. And um, so um, 
since it, it's a very interesting case, let's take a closer look at the Buddhist climate action puja. The short ritual consisted of several individual prayers and practices that had been arranged by one of the group members. Um, and particularly uh, two of these practices are very interesting. The Eko Sattva Vow, a quite recent Eko Buddhist practice, and the XR Solimentation Statement. The latter I will not discuss in detail now, but please note that it is a secular text read out in all sorts of Extinction Rebellion contexts. Hence, uh, you have here a secular text that has been added into a Buddhist ritual, and it's not recited at the beginning or at the end, but really central uh, in the middle. Um, the Eko Sattva Vow is a short text that originates from Joanna Macy, a Buddhist practitioner, environmental activist, and religious studies scholars. It was first developed in her book, Active Hope, uh, that we heard about already, co authored with Chris Johnston. Uh, the German text that was used by Ixa Buddhist Germany more or less corresponded to the original version. The Eko Sattva Vow here, however, has, uh, is a modified version in, in a collaboration between Joanna and Macy and uh, One Earth Sangha's co-founders, Christian Barker and Lou Lernhardt, and now consists of six vows. They read, based on my love of the world and understanding of deep interdependence of all things, I vow to live on Earth more lightly and less violently in the food products and energy I consume, to commit myself daily to the healing of the world and the welfare of all beings, to discern and replace human systems of oppression and harm. To invite personal discomfort as an opportunity to share in the challenge of our collective liberation, to draw inspiration, strength, and guidance from the living earth, ancestors, and the future generations, as well as siblings of all species, to help others in their work for the world, and to ask for help when I feel the need, to pursue a daily spiritual practice that clarifies my mind, strengthens my heart, and supports me when serving these vows. One is actually would be the next one, the last one. Uh, uh, well, One Earth Sangha is a relatively new eco Buddhist movement. It offers a virtual eco Sattva training in eight sessions that concludes by taking the six fold eco Sattva vow. Earthholder is a branch of uh, Tichna Tan's uh, Plum Village community that applies his teachings on engaged Buddhism and environmentalism. And many XR Buddhist Germany members uh, are from this group. And they often collaborate also with XR. They also have, I think, a local group that is kind of uh, included in XR in Berlin. They use specific meditation practices inspired by Thich Nhat Hanh. One of them is beginning anew with Mother Earth. This practice starts out with a salutation to Thich Nhat Hanh and Mother Earth. Further steps involve developing an appreciation for her kindness, developing regret for one's ill behaviors toward her, relating to one's own feelings of grief, of, of fear about the state of the world, expressing regret and promising to change one's behavior in the future. And finally, inviting Mother Earth to offer one a special name representing one's activity as a protector of Earth. I will come back to this practice in a moment. Um, here, before concluding, I would like to compare two Buddhist approaches for tackling climate change we can observe here. The traditional Mahayana approach does, in, does so in the course of general Buddhist practice, such as, for example, through the practice of resolute aspirations. While they may not appear functional as a countermeasure from a non-Buddhist perspective, their effectiveness is not questioned by the tradition. In addition, we have to keep in mind that they are self-suggestive practices that create awareness for climate change actions. In order to change behavior, one first needs to change mental habits, which um, yeah, can be seen as the purpose of such practices. Anyway. They center on altruistic bodhisattva ideal, focus on exemplary behavior that encourages others to do likewise. In this context, our world is of secondary importance. It is one among many world, worlds or lifetimes. This does not mean one should not care for it. The contrary is true, but it is not fundamentally important in order to reach awakening. The focus is thus on ultimate aims. Better rebirth is attempted, but this is done in order to find conducive conditions to develop toward Buddhahood. And the Mahayana approach as practiced in Tibet is also quite conservative. The purity of teachings need to be traced back to the Buddha. There is consequently a stress of tradition as a guarantor of the teachings purity, and the practice of meditation is used to work with one's own emotions and views. So quite contrary, uh, this comparison is not very sharp and work in progress, and I'm discussing Ekodama Buddhist environmentalism here together, even though I believe that they are quite distinct. Well, the Ekosattva vow is also quite popular among XR Buddhists, focuses on exemplary behavior and social systematic change. Systemic change, there is a change of scope. The shift is from all beings in general, which may exist in different universes, to all beings on Earth. So this is stress, not a, 
The world is thus of key importance, ranges from personification to quasi deity, uh, as we have seen in beginning anew with Mother Earth. There's also a shift toward temporary aims. It is about seeing to it that this world remains livable, fighting climate change. And the Ecodama and Buddhist environmentalists are also open to new uh, inventions. There is an inclusion of contemporary concepts, for example, anti racist training and new or even secular practices such as the XR Declaration of Solemn Intention. Uh, contrary to Tibetan Mayana, there's not much stress of a particular tradition. Furthermore, meditation is used to induce emotions in others, such as walking meditation publicly performed as a political protest uh, to, to block a street, for example. So that was also the way why this very slow uh, practice was chosen um, when I asked. And to conclude, um, Ekodama movements like One of Sangar, uh, uh, are they uh, simply Buddhist environmentalism? Um, well, um, sorry, uh, I got mixed, mixed up. Buddhist environmentalist and Ekodama could foster inter Buddhist dialogue, which is quite valuable, but does it really, or isn't it rather predominantly an inter Mahayana Buddhist dialogue? Is it really appealing to non Mahayana practitioners? I, I wonder. Um, and are Ekodama movements like One Earth Sangha simply Buddhist environmentalism, or already something else? The term Ekodama is used not. Buddhist environmentalism or eco-sangha. For me, this indicates that the stress lies on the doctrinal level, which is which it might attempt to change. In a recent interview, David Loy stated, how does Buddhism need to change? And he even asked, I quote, how much does seeking nirvana or even dwelling in emptiness, how much is that at this point becoming problematical and that we need a new understanding? So is Ekodama, and I, I conclude something new, a syncretic form of Buddhism information? Is it a product of cultural exchange processes among different Buddhist traditions, the West and environmentalism in a time of crisis? This is actually highly interesting as someone who studies cultural exchange process in the face of formation of Tibetan Buddhism in the 11th century. It is very intriguing to, to watch now such processes taking place here in, in real time. So uh, this is what I'm, uh, or the question is also how the tradition actually responds to this. So this is what I'm leaving you in the end with more questions and answers and I'm welcoming of course your comments and questions.